And so we know, we have known for decades, that one risk factor for osteoporosis is eating too much animal protein and too much sugar, um, because both of those things will change the pH in a negative way. So if you focus more on, you know, all the stuff that we know we're supposed to do anyway, like half the food that goes in your mouth is supposed to be a non-starchy vegetable, right? I mean, that's what everybody tends to agree on, no matter which kind of diet you eat everybody says yeah 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 more veggies more veggies and that works also being very careful about things like starches even healthy starches like you know quinoa and brown rice and that sort of thing because if you do too much you still can end up with um, some pretty significant blood sugar issues that will contribute to this needing to buffer and pull the chemicals out of you know the minerals out of the bone Welcome to Stronger Bones Lifestyle Podcast. I am Debbie Robinson, your host and guide on your Stronger Bones Lifestyle Journey. My next guest is Dr. Wendy Warner. She is a functional medicine gynecologist and hormone expert. After 14 years of OB-GYN practice, Dr. Warner founded a collaborative holistic medical practice in suburban Philadelphia. There, she focused on a functional integrative approach to health and healing, working alongside practitioners from many different backgrounds and offering a wide variety of therapeutic options. In the fall of 2022, she moved her practice to fully online, providing telemedicine exclusively. She is board certified in gynecology and holistic integrative medicine and is certified functional medicine practitioner and herbalist at Mesa Center. She is nationally recognized speaker and educator and is faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine, as well as David Winston's Center for Herbal Studies. She authored a chapter in the current edition of Rakel's Integrative Medicine textbook and is the co-author of Boosting Your Immunity for Dummies. She is past president of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Warner. I am looking so forward to speaking with you today. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to it, too. Yes. Okay, so I asked you a few questions before or to bring up some topics and you picked something that was so intriguing to me when I read the question. So the question that you said you'd like to speak about is non-conventional explanation of what a DEXA scan actually tells us. So right. I would love to hear more about that. So I was taught in medical school. Well, actually, I take that back. It was not in medical school. The first time I ever even heard about DEXA scans now I've been in practice a long time, but the first time I ever even heard about DEXA scans was from my Fosamax rep, because prior to that time, the only people that ever actually did DEXA scans were rheumatologists. And even that wasn't very often. And general gynecologists didn't because, well, you know, if we found osteoporosis, what were we going to do about it? So as soon as Fosamax hit the market, they went out of their way to teach every gynecologist about DEXA scans. And so that, you know, if we found abnormalities, we'd prescribe their drug. And I know that sounds cynical, but it's how it was. So what they told us is that it tells you um, your risk of fracture and, you know, we got all worried and we were, you know, treating people, blah, blah, blah. All right. If you really look at what a DEXA scan is telling you though, it's telling you your risk of fracture, which is not actually the same thing as your rate of fracture. And there's a distinct difference there. Um, you have to think about the bones, the structure of bone. So there's this, you know, protein collagen matrix that acts like a scaffolding, and then you hang the mineral on that. And the DEXA scan is telling us about the amount of mineral, but it's not telling us anything at all about the protein matrix. So it's really telling you how dense the bones are, but that doesn't necessarily correspond with how many fractures you're going to get. So it sounds silly, but this is how I explain it to my patients. I said, think about bird bones. Now, bird bones are not particularly dense. However, how many birds do you see walking around with a broken leg? Not very often because they're sort of flexible because they've got this great protein collagen matrix that sort of has a little give to it. So they don't really have to be that mineralized. Now think of chalk, super dense, but 
super easy to break because there's nothing holding it together. So I have all these patients in my practice who have frankly, rather alarming numbers on their DEXA scans, but they are, you know, they're active people, they'll trip, they'll fall, they don't break anything because they've got great protein collagen matrices. Now that doesn't mean that if you've got a really low mineralization, I'm just gonna ignore it. No, of course we wanna build the mineralization up, but I like to point out to people that the DEXA scans really don't tell you that much. Now, next step, way back when we were using the DEXA scans to um, probably inappropriately treat a bunch of people for osteoporosis or osteopenia, the World Health Organization kind of got concerned about how the United States was using DEXA scans. And so they spoke to a research group in the UK and said, could you come up with a better modeling system? So they came up with what's called a FRAX score, which I'm sure that your people know about. And those, it's based on individualization. Um, you know, that's why when you go get your DEXA scan done, you have to answer all these little questions like, you know, do you have osteoporosis? Does your mom have osteoporosis? You know, do you smoke, do you drink? All those things. And they use one reading from the DEXA scan, just the um, femoral neck, which is the skinniest part of the hip. So that if you're gonna break a hip, that's usually where it is. And then they come up with this calculation that tells you two different numbers. It's what's your chance of um, having any osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years, and then specifically a hip fracture for the next 10 years. It is always, always, always reassuring compared to the DEXA scan report. And I'm always surprised when radiologists don't just go ahead and run the FRAC score for you because you're really supposed to. Um, so I just do it myself and you can do it online. Patients can go in and do it online. Okay. Lots that you just said there. What is yeah. considered an, a uh, frankly alarming number on oh. the scan? Like I'd love to know that range because when I work with women, they'll come and they'll use words like severe or, you know, it just depends. It's, it's it, it depends what they were told. And there's a, so I just want to know what, from a doctor's perspective, what is considered frankly alarming? You know, osteoporosis starts at minus 2.5, um, on the frax on the uh, DEXA scan. If you start getting around three, you know, minus three or higher, I mean, that's kind of alarming, um, at least from a conventional medicine standpoint. You know, I've got a bunch of patients like that in my practice. My mom's had that kind of a report for a very long time and she's fallen and she hasn't broken her hip. So, you know, she, and she's 94 and a half. So I, I know that other gynecologists and other family doctors, when they see those kind of numbers, they get very alarmed. I just kind of go, well, all right, let's work on this. We love you. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how many women want to hear this, especially from a doctor. I really do think the fact that you have the experience that you have plays a very large role in this. And that's what's happening. Women are out there. They're scared, especially women who are naturally minded. They want, they want to be in control in some way of how they're aging. They don't right. want it to be that you have to take this medication or nothing else. And really the only tool in the toolbox for the doctors, unless they're trained at the level that you are and bring in that functional approach are medications. Right. So yeah. Um, okay. The other thing is about what time was it? Like what time, what year was it that you learned from the Fosamax rep? Oh, or ish early nineties. Okay. Early nineties, because that's what Fosamax hit the market. I'm going to say early to mid nineties. I started practice in 90 in 1990. And it was very shortly after that because I was still in my very first building. That's how I know. <laughs> so, um, cause what I had heard is that this company called Merck came up with a new medication called Fosamax and they needed a way to share that medication. So they funded a company that had a machine called a DEXA scan. So really the, which is very interesting. Oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe your story is accurate. I don't know. I just always assumed that the rheumatologist had it prior to that and were using it occasionally. And just the rest of us didn't know about it. You may be right. I don't know. Yeah. Prior to, I believe the nineties is when women, if they would fall and have a fracture, that's when a diagnosis of osteoporosis was given. So not until you had a fracture. Okay. So that was when one thing you said, then you said the alarming, which I loved. Um, <laughs> And then really talking, you were talking about the two differences you said were, what were the two different terms you said between um, the fracture? Oh, the risk the versus rate. the rate. Yeah, so right. It, Technically, what the DEXA scan is telling you is your risk of fracture. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to fracture it. You know, it's sort of like having a genetic predisposition for something doesn't necessarily mean that thing is ever going to happen. So the risk of fracture and the rate of fracture is very different because I know, at least from personal experience in my practice, I have all of these patients who, according to their DEXA scans, their rate of fracture should be much higher than it actually is. Yeah. Do you find a correlation between smaller petite women having, you know, higher readings, like a higher negative score? Well, you know, that's the other problem with DEXA scans. It was the numbers that they used to do the calculations, the initial calculations were based on average size white women. So they're not as accurate for very small people. They're not as accurate for very big people. They're not accurate. They're not as accurate for Asian people or brown people. I mean, it's, they're comparing everybody to sort of the same baseline, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. I find a lot of women that I work with are petite. And when I ask, cause I'm virtual and I'll say, how tall are you? What do you weigh? And I'm just amazed, like someone's four foot 10. And I, I actually think that they say that DEXA scans aren't even valid on children. So, if oh is, yeah. yeah, they're not. Yeah. So, and that's what I try to tell people is if you have a smaller bone and they're emitting light and they have a sheet underneath, that's going to be picking up the light. There's going to be more light picked up on your small bone than there is a bigger bone. And so you're going to have a reading. Yeah. And, and that's what I feel this way about DEXA scans that we can't hang our hat on a DEXA scan. No. And, um, just as an anecdote, I actually have in the past had a patient who was very, very petite. She was under five feet tall and weighed less than hundred pounds. And the radiologist went ahead and read the DEXA scan, but had like a disclaimer in the result saying this result may not be as accurate due to patient's size or something like that. Yeah. So just for women to know that, because really that moment that a woman gets a diagnosis of osteoporosis, the rug is pulled out from under you. You go from, from not even really thinking about your bones, but not even really to feeling like you are fragile and breakable. And then you stop moving, you stop using it. If you don't use it, you lose it. You lose muscle density, you lose bone density and you get tight in your joints. So it's just this whole slippery slope of fear that people go into. Mm -hmm. And that is a big reason why I have this podcast. My whole goal is to show women what is possible and to hear from professionals in the industry, like what you're ch sharing with us to kind of, you know, soften. Like I look at it, like, here's this ball of fear. You have a diagnosis, you have osteoporosis and we're going to take the eraser and start erasing the line. So it's not, we're, mm -hmm. it's not, we're not so attached to the fear of this so that we could figure out what we need to do. Yeah. And the other thing that I just want to mention about DEXA scans, because nobody much points it out, there's a fairly significant amount of radiation you get when you get a DEXA scan. Oh, wow. And, oh yeah. I mean, it's more than a chest X-ray. Um, and so unless there's a really strong need to get one, um, I, I am not a firm believer in getting them, you know, every two years after menopause or whatever, like I'm supposed to do, um, because I don't find that you're going to get enough information to that frequently to justify the radiation. Wow. You know, I wanted to do a test. I asked my friend who's a physician, I said, what do you think about me going for 10 consecutive DEXA scans in a row? And just to see if there's any shifting or a month's worth, because what I, I thought is that it's a really low um, exposure. She no, said, it's, no, I wouldn't do that. No, it's fairly high. Now, the other thing that's interesting, and this is just, I've never had it explained to me in a way that makes sense. You're not supposed to compare a DEXA scan from one manufacturer's machine to another manufacturer's machine. Now, no one's been able really to explain to me why that's true, because in theory, if you're measuring the same thing, it shouldn't make any difference who makes the device. Like, I mean, a stethoscope is a stethoscope, an x-ray machine is an x-ray machine. And so what is there that makes it so difficult to compare them? It kind of makes me wonder how accurate they actually are. I love it because really it is that diagnosis that it's, it's, it 
governs everything for a woman that has this diagnosis and the fear and grasping at straws. Um, I'm a functional health coach. I run functional labs. I'm a yoga therapist. And when I work with women functionally and I ask for their supplementation list, it is amazing. This entire list of supplements and it, grasping for straws because mm. they're, you know, like taking calcium, taking vitamin D, taking this, that. And then I explain to them, well, you know, your liver and kidneys have to manage all of that and you have to right. make sure you're digesting. And, you know, so there's, there's all that. All right. right. Well, that's lovely to hear. Thank you so much. I know a lot <laughs> of women. I think, I think that if we could be uh, with women listening to this, we would hear the sighs of relief because that's exactly what that does. Yeah. Okay. So the next question that you'd love to discuss is how stress management and balancing stress hormones helps to build bones and helps to build muscle. People will sometimes know about the stress hormone cortisol, but a lot of people don't know the stress hormone DHEA. That is, well, when we're of reproductive age, we get a little bit of DHEA from our ovaries and we get it primarily from our adrenals, which means once we hit menopause, it's only from the adrenals. DHEA has got a ton of jobs. It is a great anti-inflammatory. And it also, in terms of bone, well, that's important for bones in terms of inflammation because you want to keep your inflammation to a minimum uh, when it comes to osteoporosis, which is why cortisol is a problem because cortisol, high cortisol is very inflammatory. But more importantly, to get back to the DHEA, we know that DHEA and testosterone stimulate osteoblasts. And so you want to keep your... DHEA up because the osteoblasts are obviously there to build your bones up. How does that, why is that important? And why is this an issue when you've been stressed out? Well, ideally, we'd have normal stable cortisol and normal stable DHEA, but that's not actually what happens. Generally speaking, if we're living in the fight and flight reaction, cortisol has gone up. DHEA initially goes up just to keep you calm during the emergency so you don't do anything stupid. But then over time, as you're, you know, continuing to live your life like a tiger's chasing you, your body keeps the cortisol up and it goes, you know what, we're running out of steam. We can't keep making that and the DHEA. So the DHEA kind of drops off. Well, okay, because it's more important to get away from the tiger than to feel good and be able to stay calm. But that hurts our bones in the long run. Because now we don't have the stimulation for the osteoblasts. The other problem is once our ovaries have retired, all of our testosterone has to come from the DHEA from the adrenals. And why, why is it important to keep testosterone up? Well, testosterone also builds bone by stimulating osteoblasts. That's also how we keep our muscles in good shape. Um, you know, got to have good, strong muscles to help protect the bones and also so that you have better balance and you don't fall. And that's why most newly menopausal women come in and they go, hang on a second, this is not fair. I eat the same way. I'm exercising more, if anything, and I'm getting fat and flabby. Like, what's that all about? Well, it's because you've lost the testosterone from your ovaries and you have to rely on what's coming from your adrenals, which is usually a lot less. So you lose muscle fairly quickly when you first become menopausal. Um, keeping the DHEA up by doing better stress management and convincing your body there's not really 10 tigers back there, the cortisol will come down, the DHEA will stay up, and in the long run, you end up with better bones. Yeah, I call it balance on the inside, right? We think that we need mm -hmm. better balance when we have osteoporosis, we want to stand on one leg, but we need an internal balance. And cortisol is a catabolic breakdown hormone, and DHEA is a anabolic hormone, right? It's a building hormone, right? And right. so... Yeah. And so man stress management is huge. And actually there's NIH studies that show that psychological stress contributes to bone loss. So we know this from studies as well. Um, and they say stress is behind 99% or 90%. It's really behind like 99%, right? So, but you, but I also think we need to use stress as our friend. And so using stress as our friend, meaning, especially when it comes to yoga, when it comes to mechanical stimulation, creating the appropriate stress so that your body, body will respond by building more bones. So asking for more, um, but yes, it's really important. So what are some of the tips that you share with ladies? Do you do bioidentical hormones? When I prescribe bioidenticals, I only prescribe bioidentical. I mean, when I prescribe hormones, I always prescribe bioidentical hormones. And then do you do any testing uh, to, for the bioidenticals? Is there any kind of functional testing you do or is that all blood test? Okay, 
I actually do an entire hour lecture on how difficult it is to find the right kind of testing for the right kind of hormone replacement following. Because depending on how you're using the hormones, you have to do different kind of testing to follow them. Because some forms of hormone replacement, like if it's a cream for progesterone, there is no testing that is accurate for following blood levels, you know, following appropriate levels of progesterone cream. It's inaccurate in blood, it's inaccurate in saliva, it's inaccurate in you know, urine. Um, so depending on how the practitioner prescribes the hormones, whether they do, I, I do buccal troches primarily. And so you can Wait, get reasonably, a buccal, you don't know what a buccal troche is. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> Let me do my quickie on hormones. Um, I don't ever prescribe oral estrogen because we know that increases inflammation and chances of strokes and gallbladder problems and CRP and all this other stuff, which would be kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. So that's why people started doing topical estrogens um, to keep it away from the issues of the oral. Well, you can do patches, you can do creams, but uh, the problem there is that they are, these are fat soluble hormones. And so if you put them on a body part where there's any fat under the skin, what's to keep it from just hanging out in the fat instead of going into the bloodstream to get to where it needs to work? Um, and if you're going to have a patch, I mean, you're obviously going to put that someplace where there's going to be some fat. I don't care how thin you are. You're going to put the patch on like your belly or your backside. And no matter how thin you are, there's some fat there. And with creams, you know, you can put it on your wrist, on the inside of your elbow, that sort of thing. Uh, my younger brother is a veterinarian, and many, many years ago, he sent me this article that was so funny. There was this little old spade poodle who started acting like she was in heat, and it took them a really long time to figure out that the reason that happened is because the owner started using estrogen cream, and she would put it on in the evening, not really rub it in very well, and then cuddle her dog all night, and it would rub off onto the dog. Of course, that's a problem, too. So... To avoid all of that, I do something called buccal troches. Now, the troche itself is about a, it's kind of like a saltwater taffy, about that consistency. It's a little square. They come in a little box. There's a square for every day of the month. All the hormones you need can go in there. Well, I mean, not thyroid hormones, but all the um, menopausal replacement can go in there, like, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, it can all go in there. You take the troche. The way I do it, I have people do it twice a day. So you take the little square. You cut it in half and you put it in here between your cheek and gum and it gets absorbed directly into the bloodstream that way. You don't have to worry about fat. You don't have to worry about it rubbing off on anybody. And then you just put the other half in 12 hours later. It's really convenient. And because the absorption is so good, I can use teensy ninety amounts of hormones to get adequate levels. Is it called a buccal trochus? Buccal trochus. Okay. I think I need one of those. <laughs> Um, okay. Wow. So thank you. That's great. Uh, let's move on to speaking about food and about clean food. And what do you mean when you use the word clean with food? Well, a couple of things. Um, overall, you want to eat in a way that is as healthy as possible, meaning keep your blood sugar stable. If we eat like most Americans and our blood sugar is all over the place, that raises the pH in your blood. Well, I'm sorry, it changes the pH in your blood. It makes you more acidic. Your body does not want acidic blood. So what it does is that it pulls minerals out of the bone to do a chemical process called buffering the pH. And so we know, we have known for decades, that one risk factor for osteoporosis is eating too much animal protein and too much sugar um, because both of those things will change the pH in a negative way. So if you focus more on, you know, all the stuff that we know we're supposed to do anyway, like half the food that goes in your mouth is supposed to be a non-starchy vegetable, right? I mean, that's what everybody tends to agree on. No matter which kind of diet you eat, everybody says, yeah, 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 more veggies, more veggies. And that works. Also, being very careful about things like starches, even healthy starches like, you know, quinoa and brown rice and that sort of thing. Because if you do too much, you still can end up with um, some pretty significant blood sugar issues that will contribute to this needing to buffer and pull the chemicals out of, you know, the minerals out of the bone. 
The other issue when I say the word clean is if you're eating non-organic produce or conventionally raised animals, they're going to have an awful lot of pesticides and herbicides and other new to nature chemicals that our bodies are not used to dealing with, many of which are what we refer to as hormone disruptors. And they will then change the whole hormonal milieu in your whole body, including in your bone. And um, an organic diet, a primarily organic diet, has been shown to decrease your chance of getting osteoporosis. Okay, really interesting. So when you speak about, I know that they say that animal protein is acidic and it contributes to metabolic acidosis and then you're going to, but I say your bones are going to dissolve because they do dissolve. It's a process of dissolving. And, um, and I always tell ladies, focus every day. Are you building or dissolving? Building or dissolving? So my question then is, when we talk about animal protein being acidic, what about people who want to be vegetarian or want to be vegan? Like that's a big, I have so many women that come to me that are vegetarian or vegan. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like, can you be vegan and vegetarian and build strong bones? And if you do eat animal, what's the limit? Like what, what's too much animal protein? Well, yes, you can definitely have appropriate bones when you're vegan or vegetarian. Um, what is protein made out of? Protein is made of amino acids. Well, every single time you eat a plant, you're eating amino acids. And the only difference between plant proteins and animal proteins is that animal proteins have all the essential amino acids and plants in general don't. I mean, like quinoa does, but that's about it. So you can be a vegan and vegetarian and have plenty of protein. It's just, you have to work harder at it. That's why you have to make sure that if you're eating that way, you have to have an enormous variety of foods in your life. Um, because you've got to cover all your bases because, you know, this vegetable is going to have everything except these two amino acids. And this vegetable is going to have everything except these two amino acids. So you have to just kind of make sure you're eating lots to cover all your bases. And I quite frankly find that in my patient population, I can probably count on one hand the people who are really, truly good conscientious vegans and vegetarians that make sure they're getting all of their bases covered because, you know, we're all busy people and tend to eat the same, you know, 20 foods all the time. Now, um, in terms of animal protein, you know, I was, um, I was a pescatarian for a really, well, name a way to eat and I've done it other than maybe macrobiotic, but I was pescatarian for a really long time because I was just horrified at how most animals are raised um, in this country. And this was a while back when it was a little bit safer to eat that much fish. I mean, I, I don't eat that much fish anymore because it's problematic with the mercury and all the stuff that's in the ocean. I then moved to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is just north of Philadelphia. And it's very, I'm in a suburb, but just beyond me, it's very rural. And I've got the world's best farmer's market. And so as I'm going to get my produce, I'm talking to the guys who raise the chickens and the family that raises pigs and the people who have the beef herd. And they start pointing out to me because, you know, they found out I was a doctor and they wanted to impress me. And they started pointing out to me that, you know, if you take beef, if you take beef herds and you only let them eat pasture and maybe in the winter, some organic alfalfa and you never feed them grains, that meat is actually perfectly healthy. It's got plenty of CLA and other, you know, chemicals that would otherwise have gotten replaced if you went to the feedlot and fed them corn. So, you know, do I eat a lot of beef? No, because I just don't really like it. Um, but a small amount here and there is fine. Um, chicken is actually more inflammatory than beef. It's got less saturated fat, but it's got more arachidonic acid. So I tell people now, I'll eat pretty much anything as long as I know who raised it. But if you look at my plate, half to two thirds vegetables and the meat is sort of a secondary thing. Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, yeah, it does. It does. You know, one thing I tell people, because for women who are vegetarian or vegan, what I say, because there's times where I've been vegan or vegetarian and I've done raw, um, if grass can grow a cow, a horse, an elephant, and a gorilla, and a bison, it can grow a human, right? 
Right. So, um, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. And I, the, if I describe the way that I eat, it is the word clean. And for me, when I say clean, I want to make sure that it was yes, ethically raised. So energetically that it's got really great energetics, whether it's, if, if it's animal that it was raised properly, but also really trying to be out of plastic, not cooked in plastic, noticing what the, if it's a can, which I don't do a lot of cans, but does, does it have a BPA lining inside of it? How am I cooking it? I don't cook with foil or anything in aluminum. So I try to just minimize toxic exposure. Yeah, sounds like we're on the same page there. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, if I could ask something else, I noticed today on Instagram, I think it was a post from today that you were speaking about phase two detoxification with estrogen. Mm. And you were speaking about, I think that this is something that's really important for women to understand because not only do we not have that many hormones in menopause, we also have to make sure that whatever we have, we are effectively and efficiently metabolizing it and processing it. So if you could just speak a little bit, if that is something that can be done in a, you know, a concise manner, <laughs> uh, if you, if you could just speaking about what we do have and what, what are the, what should we be doing? What are the lifestyle practices and the habits to actually maximize whatever hormones we do have as a menopausal female? Right. And you know, it is interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm trying to get out there to people that we still have to think about our estrogen, even when our ovaries have retired, because I think a lot of people just think, okay, done with that part of my life. Don't have to think about it. Well, we still are making estrogen. It's just that all of the estrogen we're making at this point is coming from a non ovarian source, mostly from fat um, conversion of other hormones out in our fat cells. Now we, when we're done with our estrogen, our body takes it to the liver, the liver then processes it in two different phases to get rid of it because you have to take this fat soluble hormone and turn it into a water soluble hormone so you can pee and poop it out. Phase one is a little more complicated. Phase two, um, and the reason that we, you know, phase one is important because it's getting you down to the first layer of detoxification products. They are still fairly active. So it's very, very, very important that you have phase two going really well because otherwise you just have these breakdown products that are still hanging around being active. So, you know, in functional medicine, we talk about make sure phase two is working before you ever try to fix phase one. Um, just like those two phases are great, but you got to make sure that they are then able to excrete, meaning can she poop these things out <laughs> and can she pee these things out? Because if you're not doing that, don't, don't rev up phase one or phase two. So phase two involves primarily, um, chemical process called methylation. Now this is genetic. We either do it really well or we do it really poorly. There's several different genes involved. Um, I know way too much about my own genes. And um, I think of all the different genes that are involved in methylation, I've got like one or two that work pretty well and the rest are subpar, shall we just say. And so that means that I, like a lot of people out there, and this is very, very common, like 30 or 40% of the population have methylation um, gene SNPs. And things we can do to improve methylation is first start, I mean, yes, you can take supplements, but that will almost put you at risk for having some issues because it's very easy to over-methylate somebody and they actually feel worse. So I try to start with foods. And there are lists of foods that you can find online um, that will help. And there's foods that actually provide methyl groups, which are just a little chemical group with a carbon and some hydrogen that you need to do the process. And then there's these other foods that include chemicals that are food regulators. Now, the, food, the methyl regulators, the methyl regulators are things like green tea, berries, um, that sort of thing. And the donors, there's a bunch. Um, liver's actually going to be really important too, because I know that nobody wants to talk about that, but if you eat animals, liver's a great methyl improver because of the choline that's in there, plus some methyl groups. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different foods that you need. Um, I am going to plug a colleague's book okay. because there is um, a really lovely book all about methylation. Her editors made her talk about it in terms of aging, but it's really just about being healthy. Sarah Fitzgerald, ND, naturopathic doctor, um, wrote a book called Younger You, and it's basically 
everything you need to know about how to eat to improve your methylation. And I have people take a look at that all the time because she's made it really easy. There are food lists, there's recipes. It's awesome. Oh, great. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. So I run the Dutch test. I don't know how you feel about the Dutch test, but as what, what I love about that, not only do I see hormones, I love the car, the cortisol awakening response that I get. And then looking at the um, phase two detoxification for the liver. So when you were saying phase one, that's a sulfation that we see with the um, DHEA and then the, the androgens. Um, so when we look at that, like as a functional health coach, I am helping or coaching someone or share, sharing with them, this is the pathway that your estrogens are going down. We want to support it. So either the methylated vitamins. And then when you were talking about the food groups, sulforaphane, right? And broccoli sprouts, that's also one of, of um, them. And I think for women, really that this is a big aspect of bone health is that you have to have a function. It's that balance inside that we were speaking about, that biochemical balance inside. And because bone remodeling is a process of metabolism, it's balancing your metabolism and looking at all of the organs that are responsible for creating that balance, whether it's the gut, liver, kidneys. I mean, we've spoken a little bit about different aspects of those. So yeah, I saw your post and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Women need to, and women don't know this stuff. You know, they go to the doctor and the doctor says, here's the pill. And then they use the words, you know, I can't remember what you use the words to say um, about the, how you rated of how severe, I heard the words, I have severe osteoporosis, but you used in the beginning of our discussion today. Alarming, yeah. Frankly alarming. Um, but you know, it's like, okay, and then here's the medication. But these women, they want to do more. They want to do all they can and they need to learn all they can. And that is really my goal in having guests like you sharing what you're sharing and then even sharing your friend's book. I'd love to even maybe interview her. Um, and then I just wanted to say that some of the testing, you could do a DNA test to see, is it the MFHTR, one of the SNPs for methylation issues? Yeah, the MTHFR. Yeah. MTHFR. I have one of those as well, but I only have one. There's two that you could have, right? I have one and I also have one of the comp. Bear. Well, there's, that's what you can get done. Like at the regular labs at like Quest and LabCorp, you, they only do the two most common, but there are literally about 80 different genes that are involved in methylation. Wow. So if you do fancy testing through specialty labs, you can get those as well. You don't really necessarily need to know them. Um, in that detail, if you can just get the reg get your doctor run the regular ones at LabCorp or Quest, because it'll be covered by your insurance, and um, if you code it right, and if, if you've got one of those, it'll tell you that you don't methylate well, and you just need to eat these, you know, different kinds of foods to make sure not only is phase one going, but phase two is going as well. Okay, so liver. So I haven't had red meat in 37 years and I'm never, I wouldn't even do it. I just can't. I mean, I went to professional cooking school and I made, I roasted veal shank bones to make a red wine reduction sauce. And I said, okay, let me just try it. Let me just see if I could. I think it was 20 years into being non-meat eater. And I just took my finger there to just try it. I just don't even have the palate. But one thing I have done at various times in my health journey is I did take desiccated calf liver pills. Yeah. So you can do desiccated calf liver to support. Yeah. I was going to say, there are a lot of people that, you know, there's more and more functional medicine doctors talking about the importance of getting the choline as part of the methylation process. And you can get that from eggs and you can get that from organ meats. And so a lot of people are not interested in eating even one of those things. And so that you, companies are making them in tablet form. Yeah, a, a lot of them are coming out of New Zealand. So really ethically raised, drinking and eating beautiful grass. So I think that there's there are really um, some good products for somebody who wanted to do that. But it's also, again, we're sharing this information. It doesn't mean run out and get your calf liver. Where Yes, eat your berries, drink your green tea, because there's actually NIH studies that show that green tea improves bone density. So yes, yeah. and berries we know have a multitude, right? Antioxidants, polyphenols, they help with oxidation. Um, one of the Ayurvedic uh, practitioners one time described this. He said in the spring, when berries are so plentiful, one of the things they do is they help to scrub the intestines, just the visual of that, of typically a heavier eating phase that humans mm -hmm. would have gone through over the winter, like more fatty, more, um, you know, so then you're, you come for this spring cleanse 
and you're eating berries and it's going to scrub your intestines. That just sounded so like cleansing to me when right. you described right. it like that. Yeah, I mean, food is medicine and we can help our bone density. We can help bone metabolism but with through food what because we're supporting the organs that are managing that are orchestrating bone metabolism correct right? and i want to give just a quick little trick um, that i use for green tea i like green tea but i really like to start my morning with organic coffee so um i used to tell myself well i have coffee in the morning and then i'll drink green tea during the day while i feed patients you know and it just like never happened Five days a week, I'm making a smoothie for breakfast uh, with, you know, seeds and berries and greens and all of that. I use green tea as the liquid. Oh, wow. Really smart. Once a week, I brew up enough green tea for the whole week. And these days, I've actually, I add some hibiscus because it's very calming and it's good for people's blood pressure. My husband's got some issues with that. So he's, that's why it's in there. And so I use keep it in jars in the fridge and that way I only have to do it once a week and I can put it in my smoothie every day and that way I've got my green tea covered. Wow, that's great. Well, uh, I just did a 26 day detox and I had to give up coffee and my experience the first few days was horrific. So I still haven't, I haven't gone back, but what I found was Mm -hmm. this great mushroom blend, which has all, it has maca in it, it has other adaptogens in it. It has lions or turkey tail and cordyceps and all of these great um you know brain protective because that's a whole other topic and and i teach yoga i work with people privately to run functional labs and help them reverse their bone loss which is another question i'm going to ask you in a second um but i'm really understanding this whole cognitive aspect because if you when you lose your mind or you lose your memory you're great, you're at much greater risk of falling when you're not able to really pay attention to your surroundings. So mushrooms are supposed to be brain protective. And uh, anyway, it's called Ohm. Uh, the, the brand is Ohm. And I have been drinking that and it gives me a little like boost in the way that caffeine would. I feel good because mm-hmm. I haven't really gone back to coffee, um, except for coffee enemas, which I know is a whole other topic. Um, I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's a pretty, um, no. <laughs> Um, okay. So my question, okay, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, I was just going to say, and you're talking about mushrooms. Um, don't run out and say that this is going to definitely help your bones. But I saw quite a few years ago, it was a tiny little study on cordyceps and supposedly the cordyceps was were, were also stimulating osteoblasts. Now it was a tiny study and it wasn't done very well, so I don't know if it's accurate. But if you're going to, if you like mushrooms anyway, and you're going to be drinking something like a mushroom drink like this in the morning, if it's got some cordyceps in it, you might be helping your bones as well. Wow. Yeah. That's a whole other thing about studies and how many people and where was it? And most studies are done on mice or men, right? They're most, most studies because women have hormones that can like mess things up there. Um, so yeah. So what there, there's two things I want to say. One of them, I want to ask you a question at the end. That's kind of my, um, I, I also want to say there's a disclaimer here because you did say that don't run out and do this. Anything we're sharing is information. We're sharing information uh, in studies that we've read or researched, and um, that's what we're doing. So I can't remember what my second question was, but it was something along the lines of what you were saying about mushrooms. So that one, maybe I'll find that one. But my question for you (laughs) is this. Do you believe that bone loss is reversible? Uh, I don't just believe it. I know it's true because I've seen it happen. And I also think that as long as people are willing to make some lifestyle changes, it's not that hard. I mean, this, honestly, this is what women want to hear. I cannot tell you, like, I just cannot tell you coming from you with your experience and who you are and what you do. That just means so much to us. It's not said enough. And I've been on this mission to use this terminology and I've been shot down in many cases. You can't say that. You can't say that. So I'm asking, so I did ask if bone loss was reversible. And then my next question would be, is osteoporosis reversible? I'm not sure I understand the distinction you're making. Osteoporosis is bone loss. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, true. I guess nobody wants you to say that for medical legal reasons. Right. But the reality is I have had patients in my practice, many patients in my practice, who if they are willing to do the lifestyle changes they need to do, like clean up their diet and stop drinking alcohol, 
or at least really manipulate it. Get out and move, get better sleep, do the stress management, all of those things, and then take appropriate supplementation. Then you build your bone back and your DEXA scans improve. So if we believe that DEXA scans are diagnosing osteoporosis and the, osteo- and the DEXA scan numbers are improving, then by definition, we are improving osteoporosis. Right. And I guess the, the real thing is you're going to reverse osteoporosis the minute you go into a negative 2.4 from a 2.5. And so if yeah. you have osteoporosis at negative 3.7 and you do your darndest for a long time and you get down to 2.7 from 3.7 or 3 whatever, you still reverse bone loss. You're in, in a much better place. And if you were making all the lifestyle changes that metabolically found that internal balance to actually have that much bone building back and stopping bone loss, mm-hmm. then you have strength in your bones. You have a better quality bones, less prone to fracture. Um, so yeah, all that. Okay. I remembered what I was going to yeah. say. I just, uh, okay. you've used the osteoblast term quite a bit. And so I just wanted to say, um, for those listening that I, I like to think of osteoblasts as the builders. So the osteoblasts are the building cells and the osteoclasts are the cleanup crew. They are the bone dissolvers. That's what dissolves the bones to release the minerals into the system so the body can use it when it needs for whatever inflammation, toxicity, hormone imbalance, and all the big root causes of bone loss. All right. This has been like, for me, I am like doing somersaults inside because what you're sharing is what we want to hear. It is what we want to hear. I cannot tell you. I have conversations all the time with ladies that say, this is what my doctor told me. He told me if I don't take these medications, I'm going to um, fracture my bones within a year, fracture my hip within a year. Or there's ladies that are trying the bisphosphonate, sitting up in bed, having horrendous stomach cramps and trying to go for a few months to make that happen. And then there's the ladies that are injecting themselves nightly or going in monthly to have these injections. And when I interviewed a pharmacist in one of my last podcast interviews, and she told me that osteoporosis medications do not meet their goals. I thought, wow. And here we are like injecting ourselves and doing all of this. And well, if we're talking about osteoporosis, quote, quote, osteoporosis um, treatment medications, I just have to make a comment. Uh, The vast majority of the ones, the different drugs that are on the market are in the category of bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are known to make unhealthy bone. We figured, like when it first came out, when Fosmax, the first bisphosphonate, came out in the early 1990s, it kind of sounded smart because, you know, if the osteoclasts are building it, you know, breaking down the bone and the osteoblasts are building it up, then just stop those osteoclasts, give the builders a chance to catch up. Okay, that made sense. That sounded fine. And then we found out over the course of years that if you don't let bone do the normal bone turnover, it becomes very unhealthy. And if you stay on this bisphosphonate too long, you're at increased risk for getting what are called pathologic fractures, which I'm sure you've already talked about, where you can just be bending over to you know, make up the bed and suddenly your leg fractures it actually happened to my oldest sister. Oh, wow. And uh, because her doctor unfortunately forgot that she was supposed to stop the osteo, the Fosmax she was on. So if in rare, rare, rare circumstances, it actually makes sense to do short-term treatment. There are a couple of other drugs that work in a different way. They have a different mode of action. They are infusions. Um, they work more physiologically and they don't have horrible downsides to them. So I tell everybody, if you absolutely have to do something, you have to go see a rheumatologist because they're the only ones that are going to be able to get that drug approved for you. Um, I still think the average person can avoid them, but definitely under no circumstances use a bisphosphonate. You're just asking for trouble. Oh, wow. That's like a big statement. It is a big statement, but I really strongly believe it. Wow. Okay. Really, you're, this is just, this is amazing. I hope that we do more together. I think that this is going to be so well received by my community. And Great. this is lovely. Okay. So how can women find you? Okay. So my website is really easy. If you remember my name, it's wendywarnermd.com. Um, my Instagram account is at wendywarnermd. 
uh, got a Facebook page that is the same. So that's probably the easiest way to find me. Okay. And then uh, if somebody wanted to work with you, are you only licensed in certain states? I'm licensed in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Okay, so for all the lucky ladies in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, here you go. For the rest, we're going to have to figure out uh, what you can offer on a different capacity that is not necessarily through that route. Um, and then also your your Instagram is amazing. And so I was looking at it today, thank looking you. at the phases of detoxification and of the liver. And I think that's really lovely. So thank you so much. And we really, we need you. We want you. I, I really mean that. From I'm, I'm speaking here as a person that is speaking with lots of women behind me of conversations I've had for years. This is what we want. This is what we want. This is what we need. So thank you so much for sharing this wisdom with us. You are quite welcome. When I found out that you were going to be doing this podcast, it's like, ooh, ooh, choose me, choose me, because I want to talk about osteoporosis. It's not as scary as you're told. Well, if you ever want to talk about more things, we will. I'd love to have you on for more discussions. Thank you so much for listening to Stronger Bones Lifestyle Podcast. Bone loss is not an inevitable part of aging. We don't have to just wait for it to happen. There is so much that you can do. And that is what you will learn each week on the show. Go to my website, debbierobinson.com. If you want more information about what was shared in today's episode, at the bottom of this episode in the show notes, there will be links to whatever was shared. Please subscribe to this podcast share this podcast with your friends, your family, or any women that you think may be interested or benefit from the information we're sharing. Please rate the podcast. And if you have any questions you'd like asked or answered, I would love to hear from you. Let's do this, ladies. Let's change the way the world views osteoporosis and slow down, stop, or reverse our bone loss, take charge, and show other ladies what is possible. Thank you so much for joining me.